Growing up, my mom loved to garden. She was really into that stuff. She was actually the president of her gardening club because apparently that's a thing. And then we, our house was like featured in like gardening magazines. And, uh, and so she had all these like fancy gardens. She knew all the stuff about plants and everything. And she wanted me to have a garden because she wanted a daughter. And so uh, she was like, Craig, we're gonna make you a garden in the backyard where no one sees it. Uh, and so, we, so I had this little space in the backyard and we got to plot out this land and I got to design it. And she's like, okay, you need shade plants here and this kind of stuff. And, and I wanted to put in some of these things. And she goes, okay, we're gonna put in this one plant. It's called variegated oak grass. It's the only name of a plant that I actually know. And uh, she says, but this is like a really invasive plant. So we need to put in a pot first before we plant it in the rest of your garden or else it's going to spread and it's going to take over the whole garden. And I was like, okay, that makes sense. Sure. So we do the whole thing and we're done and we make this garden. It's beautiful. And I sit there, a little 10 year old me. And I'm like, now what? She goes, well, now we wait and it grows. I was like, oh, okay. And so then I leave and I come back 10 minutes later and I'm like, oh, it still hasn't grown yet. That's weird. So I was like, oh, maybe it just needs a bit more water. And then I water it and then I leave again and I come back in 30 minutes and get a bit more time. And I'm like, it still, it still hasn't grown. So I'm like, oh, maybe what, what needs to happen, I'm going to give some water, but I'm also going to go get some fertilizer and I'll put that on top. But like that was, that was probably, that'll do the trick. And so then I give it like a whole hour and for a 10 year old, that's eternity. And I come back and I'm like, it still has, nothing's happened. It hasn't grown yet. So I'm like, you know what? I did it in the wrong order. That's the problem. I need to do the fertilizer first. And then I got the hose and I just like spraying it. And by now it's just a little swamp. And then I'm like, okay, that's it. So then I leave and I come back in an hour and it still hasn't grown. At this point, I just lost my mind over this thing. I go and I grab the whole thing of fertilizer and I'm just, and I just pour it over this whole garden and I'm just spraying it with a hose and yelling at this thing and my mom sees and she comes out and she's dragging me away. She's like, okay, well, let's just get you into sports. Why couldn't I have had a daughter? I never thought that message would make it into a sermon, but here we are. And Jesus talks so much about seeds and plants and fields. I guess it's just a matter of time. Today we're looking at uh, Matthew 13 verse 44 to 46. And right now, we're kind of in this little mini series on, uh, on these parables that Jesus tells before we get into our, Christmas, uh, into our Christmas series. So Matthew 13, verses 44 to 46. It'll be up behind me too. Jesus says this, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went and he sold everything that he had. He sold all that he had and he bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven, another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and he sold everything he had and bought it. It's two parables, but they basically mean the same thing and the field one uh, works better with my story, so that's the one we're going to focus on today. Uh, and so these two parables have one big idea. What we have to understand about parables when Jesus tells them is that they're not just some like cryptic thing. We don't want to get into the details and start being like, oh, what does he mean by the field? And what does it mean to buy this and actually get the kingdom? Like he, Jesus is telling, uh, he's trying to illustrate a big idea. And so when we read this, that's, that's an important thing for us to know is that there's just one main point. But before I think we can go into that main point, we have to understand what Jesus meant by the kingdom. Because this is something that wouldn't have been understood or would have been misunderstood by the people back then that he was talking to. And I think even today is something that we misunderstand sometimes. See, the people back then, they were, these Jew, they were the, the Jewish people who were under Roman law. They were being oppressed by the Romans and they were doing, you know, they, they had come in, they had won some war and they'd taken over this Jewish land and the Jews didn't like it. They were upset and they wanted their kingdom back. They wanted Jewish law, Jewish rules, Jewish way of life, Jewish customs to be the way, the state-ordained way that people lived. And they weren't happy with the fact that the Romans were here and the Romans had their own laws and their own way of doing life. And so they were looking for somebody to come. They're looking for a Messiah to come and actually overthrow the Romans and to bring about their kingdom back again. Jesus says in Luke 17, people are going to look for the kingdom and they're not going to be able to see it. They're not going to be able to find it. Why? Because the kingdom is not a physical place. The kingdom that Jesus brings is not a physical place. The kingdom that Jesus is talking about is internal. The kingdom is Jesus ruling and reigning in our hearts so that his laws 
become our way of life, so that his priorities become our priorities, his values become our values. Jesus didn't come to bring about a political revolution. Jesus came to liberate us spiritually. So when we understand that, we can look at this big idea. Jesus says, the man found the kingdom, a treasure in the field. And he went and sold everything he had. And he was happy. He, he had to go sell everything he had to buy the field, but he was happy to get this. The big idea Jesus is trying to illustrate is that the kingdom of heaven, Jesus ruling and reigning in our hearts is greater and better than anything and everything that this world has to offer us. That's the big idea Jesus was trying to get across. There's a word he uses. He says, in his joy. In his joy, he went and sold everything that he had so that he could get this. And, and the exchange of losing everything that he owned in exchange for this kingdom was a joyous thing. This person actually took joy in that. It wasn't just like, oh, it's better and I know that it's better. It was like, no, I'm joyful that even though it cost me everything that I got the kingdom. I think something that we have to realize that happened back then is there were no big governments. There's no health care. There's no safety nets for if you, you know, get impoverished to sell your land, to sell your crops, your farm, your cattle, your house, was to be functionally dead. This man, to give up everything he had, would basically be condemning himself to die, whether exposure or starvation or whatever it is, but still, even in the face of dying, of being sure that he is going to die, he still considered it joy to acquire the kingdom. And I don't think we can really relate to that. I think we actually struggle to understand this idea, like to lose everything, but to have it spark joy Listen, I love Mary Kondo. I mean, my wife bought the book. We went through our house. We did the thing. We looked at everything. Does this spark joy? No. Okay, we're going to throw it out. And I was like, babe, this process doesn't spark joy. And so she threw me out. And so I'm like, I mean, I've done that, right? I get it. But lose everything and it spark joy? I think sometimes we're scared to give up, to surrender something to Jesus because we think that if we do that, it means Jesus is going, to have, is going to take that away from us. I think sometimes we think that giving something up to Jesus means automatically having it be taken away from us. And I don't think that's the case. I don't think Jesus wants to just take stuff away from us when we enjoy those things. I don't think that's what he's after. Psalms 37 verse 4 says this, Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. I'm going to take a second just to explain that really quick because there's a qualifier here that's really important or else you're going to take this all sorts of ways. Take delight in the Lord. That's the qualifier. Take delight in the Lord and then he gives you the desires of your heart. So the desires of your heart have to be poor. Guys, if you're out there and you're praying, you're like, Jesus, if you could, take, if you could call my wife back up to heaven early because I'd really love a new one, that's probably not going to work out for you. As a matter of fact, if you pray that prayer too loud, you're probably going to be the one getting called up to heaven a little early. Have you ever listened to country music? Wives love killing their husbands. They sing about it all the time. Okay, we're getting off track. Matthew 7. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father in heaven give good gifts to you, to those who ask him? See, I don't think God calls us to be physically poor. I don't think God wants us to take everything away from us. I don't think we can read that in the parable. But what I do think is that God does call us to be spiritually poor. And here's what I mean by that. Jesus tells another parable in Luke he details a story of two men who come before the temple to worship God. And one is a Pharisee. He's a religious man. He follows all the rules. He's a good person. He does everything right. And he comes and he stands before the temple to worship God. And he says, God, thank you that I'm not like all these other people, that I'm such a good person. You call me to fast once, once a week. I fast twice a week. You call me to give a little bit of tithes here. I give double what I have to give. He says, God, here's all the rules that you've made for me. I've made more rules for myself on top of that just so I'm such a good person. And he comes before the throne of God, spiritually wealthy. God, look at all these things that I've done. And he, he lays down his spiritual coins before God. 
The second man, a tax collector, a Jewish tax collector, someone who who would have betrayed his own people, takes money from the Jews and gives it to the Romans who oppress them, hated by his entire culture. He sits in the corner. He can't even lift his eyes to to, to God as he worships at the temple. And he says, God, I'm so sorry. Have mercy on me, a sinner. And he approaches the throne of God spiritually bankrupt. And he says, God, I have nothing. I need you. So Jesus says, the kingdom reigning in your hearts is the greatest thing you could ever have. It's better than anything that this world has to offer. And then what we do is we go and we try them out, right? We take Jesus and we put him in a pot in our little field and we, we quarantine off certain areas and we go, okay, Jesus, you can have, you know, my Sundays or you can have how I dress or how I speak or you can have these little things. But th- these other things over here, you know, the things that I look at or what I, how I talk or, or whatever, or how I act when I'm at work. No, no, no. I still, I'm going to control these things. I'm just going to try you out. I'm just going to do a couple of these little things over here. And we, we pot him. We stick him in this little pot and we keep him out of these different areas. I went back to my house uh, five years ago or so and uh, my, my dad was sick with cancer and mom didn't have a lot of time to do gardening anymore. And I was sitting down on the deck and I looked and I saw my little garden in the corner in the back. And I was like, oh, I'm going to go check that out. It looked like overgrown. And so I go and as I walk up to the garden, I see that my oat grass is dead. And I'm like, what the heck? I was like, I sit here and I lovingly take care of you and I give you everything that you need and you die. And then I go and I leave you and I give you a lot of space and you die. I was like, I don't understand gardening. This stuff doesn't make any sense. See, Jesus was not meant to be potted. Jesus wasn't meant to be placed in a pot and quarantined in your life. Christianity is a terrible hobby. See, if all you do with Jesus is you just give him, you know, your Sunday or you give him your Wednesday nights and you do this and then you, you just give him a bit of your language or whatever it is, you give him these controlled things, then Jesus isn't actually your Lord. Jesus is just a supplement that you take to improve portions of your life. Here's the thing, it, ju- it just won't work. Like, don't waste your time. Because all you're going to do is you're just trying to hold on to your life and you're just trying to have Jesus improve these things and he's not about doing that. And it's going to feel like a burden. It's going to feel like a set of rules that you have to memorize, that you have to abide by. Oh, I got to do this and okay, I'm going to church now so I can't say those words, all these things. And it's just like, it's just like the set of rules and there's going to be no joy in that. And you read these verses and you go, I don't understand how there could be joy in losing everything for the sake of Jesus, for the sake of his kingdom. Why? Because some of you, he's just a supplement. He's just a part of your life and you've quarantined him off. I, I hate preaching these messages. I hate coming up here and preaching these ones. And I always seem to end up getting stuck with them. But I feel like such a hypocrite. Because my field is a mess. I like I got a little pathway where people walk by and they can see my life. And I got Jesus potted all along. But on the other side, there's just dead spots all over the place. So like a couple months ago, I got in a minor car accident, just like a fender bender. And it wasn't like serious enough to go fix right away. And so I was kind of just not fixing it. And I pull up into this, I don't know, it's like a 7-Eleven or something. And I remember as I pulled up, there was a super nice black Mercedes right beside me. And I was like, oh, it's it's like one of those cars, it costs a kidney just to look at it. It's just like, oh, it's just nice, you know? I was like, hey, don't hit that because it's going to cost more than my car's worth just to repair that. So I pull up and then I get out of my car. And as I'm walking into the 7-Eleven, as I'm getting down and walking in, this guy comes out. He's about my age. And he's just got this nice suit, this haircut. And I'm like, what is that? Like Italian silk? He's got like a jawline that you have to buy. Like you don't get born with that kind of thing. And I was like, what are you, like a lawyer who models for Abercrombie in your spare time? Like were you designed in Switzerland? Like, and he's just like, oh, he just looked good. And we walked by and I was like, oh man. And then I see him take out his keys and I, and I look back and he's getting into that black Mercedes as he walks by my just like trashed front bumper. And my heart just like drops. And in that moment, I feel bad about myself. Oh, man. And then I come here 
And I stand up here and I tell you, you got to sell every, every inch of your field. You got to give it all up to Jesus. All the while, my field's like a mess. I go home, I'm like, Carrie, you know, I think my wife, I, I think I need a new car. And she's like, what? You need a new car? Why? I've never heard you talk. I was like, I don't know. I'm just feeling like maybe a little change up. Let's like, I think I need to get a new car. She's like, you never talked about getting a new car. Your car is fine. Why? I was like, I don't think I'm going to go down to like the Mercedes dealership or something maybe. <laughs> I got dead spots in my life and, and I know that feeling. I know that feeling when you feel like you're being held captive by the lies of this world. I know that feeling when that job doesn't work out, when people are gossiping about you or rejecting you in social settings. You don't get into the school you want to get to. I know that feeling when you go and you pick up your kid and there's little Mr. Perfect in his bow tie and lunchbox. And then your kid's like covered in glue and, and just like looks like a mess or you got to go like walk to the principal's office. It's the walk of shame for you. And you just feel, oh, you feel bad about yourself. You feel ashamed. I know that feeling. But I also know that there's freedom. See, I know that when God reigns and rules over your heart, when, you, when he's not a supplement, but he's actually your Lord, when you let him in to your heart and you say, okay, God, I, you know, it's going to be hard to give up all these things. It's going to be a journey, but I'm going to commit to this and I'm going to let you actually transform me. I'm going to let you transform my way of life. All of a sudden, those lies, they get replaced by the truth. And all of a sudden, you start to change you start to transform and you get set free. See, I don't need a new car. Why? Because I'm not defined by what I own. I'm not defined by what I, what I make, by my job, by how I look. I'm defined by the fact that God, the King of Kings, the creator of the world knows me, chose me before the foundations of the earth were set, loves me and that I'm enough for him. That's transformation. Now all of a sudden following God stops just being a set of rules that you have to memorize and it starts becoming a new way of life. Romans 12 verse 2 it says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing, and his perfect will. See, when you are transformed, you're set free. And you are a slave. Some of you, like me, you're a slave. Your self-worth is held captive to your success. For some of you, your identity belongs to how beautiful or how capable you are. For some of you, your value is controlled by how much you contribute. And here's the problem. Some of you are actually okay with that. Some of you guys are actually comfortable with that arrangement because things are working out pretty well for you right now. Because life's going pretty good. You're pretty successful. You're still beautiful, whatever it is. It's actually working out for you and you're okay with it right now. But you're still a slave you're just a happy slave. But what happens when things stop working out? Because you'll still be a slave then too. What happens when God shakes up those things that are important to you? What happens when God takes away those things that you value, that help you identify with who you are, which build up the core of who you are? I think sometimes God allows trials in our life. God shakes up the foundations of our life. He lets things go on that we'd rather not have happened to us because we've potted him. We've sectioned him off in our field, in our heart. We've just allowed him to have a little bit of space here. We've stuck him in a pot. And God wants to break free from that. And God allows these things to come into our lives and he allows these things to get shaken up because he wants to tear down our kingdom so that he can build up his when I was uh, in college, I was, um, I, I was doing triathlons and I was actually like, you know, pretty good at it and, and I was pretty competitive and uh, through some really cool opportunities with work, uh, I ended up getting sponsored by a couple of these big different companies and it was just like everything to me. I was like, I'm a sponsored athlete. Oh, 
And, and so like, it just like, it started to consume who I was and I would bring it up in every conversation. I was like a vegan or a CrossFitter. It doesn't matter what we're talking about. I'm going to find a way to tell you about it. People would be like, hey, did you finish your homework? I'd be like, nah, you know, I didn't actually have time because, you know, remember, I'm a sponsored athlete, so I had to like do a lot of, I was working out a lot and blah, blah, blah. And people were like, oh my gosh. And it was just like everything to me. It became this like my identity. I used to be able to run a 10K in like under 40 minutes. And one day I was going out for a super chill run. Don't even make a kilometer. And God just zaps my knee, just stops working. I couldn't run anymore. I couldn't run more than two kilometers, which is not very far. I went to everything. I was, I was at high performance sports physios. I was in like physiotherapy with people who trained Olympic level runners. I was doing like the acupuncture and I was doing all that like the electro stimulus work and all that therapy and everything. We tried everything, nothing worked. I couldn't run farther than two kilometers for like five years of my life. I would get home after a failed run and I'd be so angry at God. God, why did you take this away from me? When I get angry, I usually shut down and I get quiet. But when I would come home from these runs, I would throw things. I'd be furious. Man, I was mad. I look back on my life now and I count that as joy. I didn't always. But I look back now and I see that God was breaking down this kingdom inside of me that, that I was just like consumed by that. I was consumed by that. I was building up this little kingdom around myself and I was making myself you know, feel good and this was becoming part of my identity and God just sent this, this earthquake to rupture it. And while I was mad, now, then I'm so happy now that that happened. I mean, it took a while. But now I realize that God was breaking down my kingdom so that he could build his up and set me free to something way better than what I had for myself. See, when trials come in your life, when things don't go right, can you count that as joy? When things fall apart, that you really can't have fall apart. Can you give that up to God? Can you go, okay, God, I didn't get this job that I was really hoping for, but I'm gonna trust that you got something else in mind here. I'm gonna trust that you're gonna open a different door. And although it doesn't feel good, and although I'm not happy about it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, you know what, Jesus, this is actually an opportunity for me to count this as joy because you're building your kingdom and this isn't about me, this isn't about what I want, this is about you ruling in my hearts. It's about you, your values, your way of life, your priorities becoming my values, my way of life, my priorities. See, it's easy to give up the easy things to God. Can you let go? Can you let him reign over the stuff that defines you? I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna end today a little different. I'm gonna leave a little bit of extra time for us here. Uh, but I'm going to call the, the, the worship team up again. I'm going to go out of my comfort zone uh, and do something here, and I, I hope that you'll join me in this as well. I'm going to call the prayer team to come up, and usually we, we have the prayer team in the back for people, but today I'm actually going to call the prayer team to come up and be here in the front. I think today God wants to set some people free. I think today God's been speaking to some of you. Whether you're that person who's comfortable, things are going pretty well and you're kind of okay with the situation. Maybe things are falling apart and you feel like you are captive to the ways of this world. You feel like you are captive to the lies. Maybe you don't follow Jesus at all, but you want to be free. I'm going to take this opportunity to call you. I'm going to take this opportunity to challenge you because I think God wants to claim some acreage in our hearts. And so as I've been speaking, if you feel like God has been speaking to you, if you feel like God has been moving, like as I, as I scan the different sections, if you feel like I'm looking at you and I promise I'm not, all I see is lights, that's the spirit moving. If you feel like your face is burning up and your seat's uncomfortable or people around you are looking, your spouse is like nudging you, that might not be the spirit. But... 
If you feel like that's you, if you feel like the Spirit is moving in your hearts, I want to challenge you here today to do something that is way out of our comfort zone. I want to challenge you to give up that thing that you feel like God is speaking to you about right now. I want to challenge you actually to come to the front because it's scary and it's like way out here. It's like, what's going on? We're going to leave some extra time and we're going to have a prayer team here. But I want to challenge you to actually take that step out of your comfort zone to come to the front to pray with somebody here, to pray and to take on the call to give up what you have, to surrender what you have and to take on the freedom in Christ. To take on a new life where you're transformed, where it's not just a set of rules anymore. It's a new way of living and it's joyful and it's free. Where God gives you the desires of your heart. He gives you good gifts and it's aligned to his perfect and pleasing will. I'm gonna I'm gonna really quickly pray for us and then we're gonna go into the song. And I want to invite you to come up. Jesus. I pray for our hearts today, Lord. I pray that your spirit would be moving. God, don't let us sit. Don't let us sit. And if we feel that you are speaking to us, if we feel that you are bringing something up, you're convicting, don't let us just sit there. God, please call us out of our seats. Call us to examine our hearts, to lay it before you. Call us to surrender those things that we don't want to surrender to you. In your name, Jesus. Amen.